it's a great honor to be here in front of you on this early morning, and uh, I really appreciate to, to share with you the next case. I would like to take you from the single tooth reconstruction in the posterior zone, done completely chair side that you just saw with Tim's approach, more to a, a slightly complex uh, reconstruction, the three on a bridge. You wouldn't say it's complex, but you will understand at some point that here you you have the need for a dental technician maybe even stronger pronounced than in the single tooth that you could in these days very easily uh, uh, produce on a chair side matters. So what you see here is the, the lady that I will want to present to you. You see her dental status and you can picture out in the next slide that she has a, a problem on her right hand side, a fractured tooth in the, in the first premolar and also a periapical lesion in the, um, in the uh, last molar. So what we had to do, unfortunately, for this patient was to remove the four-unit bridge, and we wanted to continue for sure for her with an implant treatment. And uh, this is now, again, or already raising the first question for us was, which implant should we place at this point? And we, we thought about it, combining this, this case completely digital. I will not go to the surgical approach in, in too, too many details, because Tim and, and also Gary will do so. But the question for us was, should we place two tissue-level implants, um, a mesial cantilever? What, what is the aim? Gary, maybe you want to comment. Yes, I think in this particular indication, two tissue level as you did is, is, a, is a perfect choice. I mean, the conditions are very favorable here, soft tissue and bone as well. In some situation, when we are getting a little bit closer to the anterior zone, like this first premolar, we can combine with a bone level implant that gives us a little bit more flexibility in the prosthetic components. This uh, is also what we thought of. Should we combine a bone level implant and a tissue level implant, but we, we kept it simple and we stick to two tissue level implants. You can see the GBR that we performed and the wound closure after uh, 15 days. So everything went event free and, and very clean. The patient was heavy, happy and didn't uh, undergo any like uh, stresses. And then we basically opened up the, the, the abutments and we initially could have the chance to, to utilize this new approach and the start with the optical impression. Very important at this point is uh, to understand the link from the mono scan body or the scan body in general that you see here in the center of the picture through the design software of your labs and dental laboratories. So it's very important to have those kind of mono scan bodies since they will make the clinical handling much easier. But then on the other hand, also your technician needs to have the understanding which of the scan bodies you used in relation to the implant. So what you see on the right hand side of the screen is the two approaches, the two scans that we did. On the, on the far right side, you see the I.O. scan, and in the center of the picture, you see the three shape um, after placing the, uh, the, the scan bodies, uh, capturing the emergence profile, and you see immediately the different uh, appearance of the two scans. On the center, you have also the color rendering included, while on the right-hand side, you, you see more or less like a green and white kind of, of picture that on to be very honest, you at this point you don't 100% need the colors, but it just it looks very fancy and the patients love it. But to me, the most crucial question at this point is: Is there still a need for any powder? So, Tim, maybe you want to answer this question. It's for me looking at this from this perspective, it seems like a big relief to getting rid of it. Absolutely, I totally agree with you, Vincent. So. Today, the patient convenience, it's more and more important. And if you use the powder, I don't like it as a dentist as well, and our patients uh, neither. And the second aspect is I like to uh, capture the 3D implant position immediately after uh, implant placement, so during the surgery. And if you use the powder the system there, that's not possible. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the way it should be. So this, for our understanding, is absolutely the future. Powder-free systems has to be you know, in, in your focus if you think of any kind of optical impression systems. So this basically reflects you know, being a dentist. But now you see that the workflow really heavily changed going to the laboratory. And uh, what has been you know, introduced to the laboratory since already now a few years is um, basically designing those reconstructions and not basically waxing it up. So there is a huge change of, of the daily routine. And as Tim shown, and we also proved it in our own studies back at the time in Zurich, um, you are so more efficient with these type of workflows and the quality of the reconstruction, the morphology, the libraries that you can ask for really makes, makes you a 
I would say, a better technician because you can focus just on what's important, the final outcome of the reconstruction, but you don't have to focus on actually physically moving wax from A to B. So here you see, once again, the two different approaches, but as you know, this is daily routine, I would say, designing those kind of reconstructions. But the real big change to us is the next slide, since in this bigger kind of reconstructions, to our understanding, you still need a dental model. We need something to work on, to do adjustments, to interact, you know, define the occlusion. It's not a single tooth, keep it in mind. It's a three-unit bridge. This could also be an anterior bridge. And here you see how strongly the, the workflow changed from the left-hand side is, is producing a classical plaster model to the right-hand side, now using the SDL files that we generated and went on through the uh, printing process to create a new digital model that we really have to use. German, I, I understood that you just recently purchased a printing device for your school, so uh, I think this was the missing link. I, I, I think that you're absolutely right that uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, change in the way uh, implant prostodontics is being done. Um, I, I still would like to see a little bit more studies on the accuracy of these printed models, uh, but totally reliable on the design on the CAD unit, but uh, this is very, very, particularly uh, the way you show on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen. So I didn't want to highlight it, but you see it's a rough business. Being a dental technician, working with the plaster is, is dusty, let's call it like this. So um, this is the future if your technicians or your, your partners, your, your industry partners don't offer you this kind of printing process, you will have a hard time to make this workflow really fly. But then the next phase is basically creating or finalizing those types of reconstruction. And the technicians in, you know, once I was trained, you define yourself basically um, layering porcelain, mixing powders with liquids and, and putting it to a dental furnace and thereby creating, uh, you know, aesthetically um, beautiful reconstructions. The problem with this approach is, first of all, it's very time consuming as we saw with Tim's studies and also with our own. And second of all, um, you see that we are doing something manually, handmade, which is beautiful. This is our skills. But on the other hand, it's just not a machined production. So here we include porosities and there's just no way to get around it. So what you see is just an example of one crown that we, we we cut it and trimmed, and you see all these black small dots, which are um, air inclusions. So they summarize, and um, in the end, besides other factors, which I will show you in the next slide, you know, just give you a weakening of the structure. So hereby, thinking especially on implants, you know, the, the high load, that uh, the high occlusion load that could be applied on these kind of reconstructions. Material defects, as I said, the roughnesses, the porosities, that dental technicians, just by the nature of producing the reconstruction, layering, in, include into the ceramic. And, you know, the oral conditions, such as moisture level and temperature. All of these are limitations. So so uh, the next slide I will share with you, and I hope the three of you, you don't make me feel alone now. It's just a few of my collected shippings that I, I want to share with you. And I could go on with this slide until the rest of my presentation, because there are so many that I gathered in my life. Um, you see the same in your daily routine? You're not alone. <laughs> Thank you. Right? Thank you very much. Who haven't seen a chipping in your case? Raise your hand. <laughs> One <laughs> in 4,500 people. Eh? So this is a big, big issue, and this is something that bothers our patients. This is something that stresses us, it stresses the whole team. We have to redo this kind of reconstruction. So this is something that has also been proven by not only my skills, but also by the literature here, by a review done by Ronnie Bjartney Pietersson and Danny Thoma, that very nicely shows you the complication rates for the classical implant-borne reconstructions that we do, and you very nicely see that the support that we receive by the industry in terms of abutments, in terms of framework, they work perfectly fine. The only problem is what me or your lab technicians deliver you is the weak but beautiful veneering ceramic that they apply and add to the frameworks. And here you have the big incidence for chipping. So this is really something that we can encounter and we should. And there the monolithic reconstructions that are predefined and preformed by the by not the university, by the industry can really help us since here we can, you know, scale down from a blank that is 
produced in, in, a, in a perfect matter. So um, just to give you an, you know, an outlook how this reconstruction could look like compared to the one you saw with Tim, again, two different products, also an ITI grant we received, and you see just superficially stained and glazed reconstructions in these days, especially in the posterior zone, look absolutely beautiful and on an aesthetic point of view acceptable. To my understanding, in, in many cases, even better than a PFM. And maybe, uh, Gary, uh, since in France there's still a lot of PFM. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we still see a lot of PFM, unfortunately, but today we're going for full monolithic and get camera restoration, yeah. definitely. So not only that it makes the reconstruction cheaper, hopefully it also prevents it from chipping. So now, kind of, Coming back to our case, you have one problem with all these new materials that there are in the market, especially after this year's IDS, you understand that there are so many more brands uh, pushing. Um, you see that we have some kind of a limitation um, when it comes to the indication. So we have a lot of products for single tooth reconstruction, but um, is there in your mind, and maybe German, in your opinion, any other product that we can use besides zirconia? Not thinking of metal, okay, but is there anything for a three-unit implant-borne bridge that you could imagine in these days? So I think that's, that's so far the, the one that is uh, winning this race. So I, I, I also think that the combination of some sort of uh, metal substructure that still being used, uh, even if you use zirconia, particularly for large bridges, yeah. would help on that. But so far for large units, zirconia is the... Um, so, the zirconia itself is uh, like a complete new topic. We could make another lecture out of it, but just to, to, to make you understand, the difference is basically uh, we mill it in, in the same way like you saw the milling of, of Tim's crown in, in the beginning. The only difference is it will be a dry milling for sure, since the material is, is similar to chalk and very easy to, to treat. You see it here on, on the center of the, of the picture, basically the, the cam process, like the nesting of the reconstruction, the three unit bridge to the blank. And then you can choose your blanks on either color free, multicolor, different translucency levels that will you know, support your aesthetics. All of this is, is a new area that we have to also understand because it's, especially for you being dentist, very difficult to judge what zirconia is actually delivered to you by your dental technician. But the beauty of the workflow is now that this is the new layering, if you want to call it like this. If you saw your technicians in the days before physically adding porcelain, in these days we are changing it to an infiltration process. And you can imagine we are working full contour, we are taking all the advantage out of the, you know, the production of the reconstruction, the design features that we have with the reconstruction. We don't have to manipulate it, we will just use like this kind of aquarelle style and adapt the, and adjust the colors to our aesthetic understanding. Um, I also agree with you if you think of a monolithic zirconia reconstruction that this is maybe not the end of our, you know, the final reconstruction. Like Yaman, you said, there is still the need for the dental technician. And I mean, I have to agree with it since I, I make my living out of being a dental technician. Mm -hmm. um, this is the change, and now you, you, if you continue with this, it's the same movie on the left-hand side, but you see after the production and after the sintering, um, there is a need for stain and glaze, for adaptation of the surface, for super, uh, superficial details that can be provided to you by your dental technician. In the anterior zone, maybe a buckle veneering, uh, but we will see a little later. The problem is, is there, you know, all of this looks very promising and it, it, it seems to work perfectly fine, but is there any evidence that we can rely on? And as Tim already mentioned to you, since everything is going so fast, you know, we are, have a hard time to, to back all these new approaches up with literature. So I just want to highlight basically one study here. It, it says like very promising, they call it even short-term results after five years for fixed dental prosthesis based on implants with a uh, monolithic zirconia. So this is really something that to my understanding and it looks very promising. Mm -hmm. The other aspect that I want to highlight is since it's a very rigid and, 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 and hard material, do we experience any additional wear? And here we have to understand that there is hardly any in vivo studies and we are looking into a lot of in, in vitro studies, but it shows that the moment you have your zirconia very nicely and clean polished, it, ex it experienced the best wear behavior to the uh, natural antagonist, even better than a classical conventional PFM reconstruction. Is there 
in, in your mind, you know, having this extremely strong material, how do the patients react to it? Is there any, like, you know, discomfort that you sense with your patients having these uh, monolithic reconstructions in zirconia? I haven't experienced that clinically, so uh, I think if, if the occlusion is, uh, is adjusted um, properly, it yeah. should function as any other restorative material. We just had a few cases like this in a three-unit monolithic zirconia-based implant supported reconstruction, but the patients feel comfortable, and uh, I think at this time it's a proper material for this indication. Yeah. What is clear, it's for the dentist as well as for the technician, if you do and have to do any kind of occlusal adjustments, you have a very hard time to to perfectly right. polish it afterwards, which in, in some of the cases, the beauty of having screw-retained reconstruction is you can even take it out of the mouth, have it properly um, you know, retouched, and go back in. So here we are, um, basically looking down at, at the cases that we do in, in Geneva. You see just a similar case, four-unit bridge, state forward. And at this point, again, like you saw in Tim's presentation, everything is now combined and, 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 and finds its 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 point into the value base. So we need the, the, the titanium resin base in order to use our milling machines and have the missing link in between the implant interface and our uh, chair side or lab side made reconstruction. So we also performed a study on, on, on the stability of the value base and uh, we did this on bone level type of uh, implants diameter reduced, and what I would really like to highlight is here you see the three test groups, the three two, uh, first test groups, it's the full zirconia abutments, different types, different implants, and you see the, the basically the behavior, the technical behavior of the, the failure itself is, is a very simple fracture at, a, at some point down the road. We did uh, 1.2 million thermal um, loads and cycling, thermal cycling, and at some point, they fracture. The question is just, is it clinically relevant at what point they fracture? But now you look at the control group, and the control group is to us the golden standard, which is reflected by the titanium care abutment. It doesn't get any more strong on this kind of implant diameter than with a titanium abutment. So you see the behavior of this abutment is basically a bending until the, the fracture of the screw. And you see that the control group, or our, like the fourth test group, if you want to call it like this, the value base, and it behaves exactly like our golden standard, it just bends over. So this also nicely counts up in values, and you can see this in the next slide. And you, you understand that still there is some issues about the try-in, working with the value base could be an issue, trying in your reconstruction. Maybe there's the cement gap that is questionable. Is that something that you are stressed with, especially on bone level implants, having the cement gap close? Yeah, I think definitely the, the fact that with this vario base, the, the bonding joint is close to the bone. Yes. Can, can, we could expect some remodeling and also it takes a little bit of space, but I think now, and we'll see in the next presentation, we have the possibility to have different gingival height that it's just been introduced and gives a lot of flexibility and we can pick between one, two and three millimeter. And, and this gives now even more reliability with this option. However, that uh, is, is important to stress that that cementation happens extra orally in the lab and it can be properly polished and uh, verify the check and adaptation yeah. of that component. I agree, but I think the introduction of different gingiva heights was a major, you know, a major step in, in the process to, to utilize it. And coming to an end, I would like just to show you the final reconstruction that we then could place intraorally and you see it's a three on a bridge in the posterior zone, so there is, it's nothing fancy, it's just something that has been done in a complete digital way, and you can imagine that on a cost point of view, on, on something that patients you know, like in terms of having not the silicon in their mouth, you achieve these results for your patients, you see it's an elderly, elderly woman, and she was very much you know, favorable for this reconstruction. I show you not only the video, but also some kind of close-up pictures. And you see for something that is stained and glazed and infiltrated, um, at least to my understanding, it's maybe not for the anterior four teeth, but it's absolutely some 
indication for the posterior zone. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude, thank the three of you from my end, and I would like to show you the patient. I would definitely also want to take the opportunity to thank the team that supported me there back in Geneva, which is uh, the post-credit assistant and uh, Irena, my boss. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a big pleasure and honor to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to you, Gary.